uh, Alessandra work in. So the, the first question is really kind of uh, framing those contexts. So I'm going to kick off. We're talking about how our organisations use open education with refugees and the key obstacles and challenges in doing this work. So for the Open University in Scotland, we work primarily with new Scots, as we call them in Scotland. So people who've arrived in Scotland um, as refugees, asylum seekers, and um, the work we're doing is very much about helping them integrate into Scottish life and Scottish culture and helping them to access um, education at whatever level they're, they're ready to access education at. Um, so some of the things that we've been involved in, we, we work in partnership a lot with, uh, with voluntary sector organisations and one of the things that we've done is to uh, develop open education resources in partnership. Um, um, and we very much focus on the kind of co-production model, so um, engaging refugees and asylum seekers in shaping the resources and, and basing them on their, their lived experiences. So we've done that in partnership with the, the Bridges Programme in Glasgow um, and we're also looking at, we're working with um, voluntary organisations to develop pathways for refugees and asylum seekers into um, education and not just higher education. And we're also working um, with, with, again in Glasgow, <laughs> with colleges in Glasgow to develop OERs that are based on um, English as a second language with a Glasgow accent because obviously <laughs> the, the, the way we speak, uh, the way we speak English in Scotland, you can probably tell I'm not from Scotland, but you know, it's very different from maybe the received pronunciation in a lot of ESOL resources. Um, so we, we have staff working with a, a college in Glasgow to develop resources specifically for refugees and asylum speakers accessing ESOL in Glasgow. Um, so what we're doing is very much kind of responding to a local context and, um, and one, of the, one of the obstacles, I suppose, have we lost Marcus? No, no. It's yes, the it's screen. Screen. We've lost the big screen. Marcus is still here. One of the big obstacles that we have, obviously, is that there is no one refugee learner. Um, we have people arriving in Scotland who had a very high standard of education in their home countries, um, and, but they, they're, um, they're English is not good enough to work at that level in Scotland and um, so their primary concern would be um, getting their English up to the standard that they want um, and then we have other other refugees and asylum seekers whose level of English might be quite good but whose level of education in their home countries w was fairly low or was interrupted uh, for various reasons and um, so there is there's no suite of resources that's going to accommodate all those different refugee journeys and all the, all those the, those different learning needs and um, so that's one of the biggest opportunities and challenges i think oer gives us the opportunity to be more responsive and um, the open university has a platform called open Learn create which allows us to very quickly develop um oer on a platform that you know the host team is free and the tools are made available for partners to work with and engage um, refugees and asylum seekers directly in producing them. So we, they're not centralised. It's it's completely um, completely local uh, solution to to identify local issues. And um, other thing, and I'd like to make a plug. The link is is on the Padlet if anybody's interested. But I um, I was involved in a project with, with Gabby last year called WeFair, which was um, refugees educational resources. And, um, and one of the things we did was to try to pull together all the OER out there that might be of use to refugees, asylum seekers and people who are working with them and supporting them. Um, so there is, a, there is an open document and the, the link is on the Padlet that if you're aware of resources that aren't on there, we'd very much like people to contribute. If your organisation is developing resources or if there are resources that you use that you find very helpful, we really would like you to contribute to that living document. Um, so I'm going to stop talking about my context here and I'm going to pass you on to Alessandro, who's going to talk about his context. Well, nice to meet you again. I'm Alessandro Decorio from International Telematic University Union. 
an online university building in Rome, Italy. And our background and approach is quite different. Uh, we, as just said, are an online, full online university. And since the very first year of our university, launched in 2005, we started developing agreements with mainly South Mediterranean countries, and then we uh, widen up the audience to provide courses and programs not just in Italian but also in other languages, in English and French and in Arabic too. So we arrived in 2010 to have quite a lot of programs and courses already developed and delivered also in Arabic. Um, we have still are producing agreements, institutional and ministerial agreements with countries of the South Mediterranean and of the Middle East uh, regions. And that's why in 2015, our rector wanted to do something to address the refugee and migration issue in Europe. Also because we are in Italy and Italy together with Greece and Spain is one of the main uh, access gate to Europe from the Mediterranean road, one of the main uh, migration routes nowadays. Um, so we started developing a specific initiative called University for Refugees, Università per Rifugiati, and you will find the link on the Padlet too in one of the last columns, providing both access to a sort of recognition services of service of previous academic careers for refugees, and also for professional skills according to European standards, and also providing language courses through uh, online course and also through a free to download app developed uh, just for them to be downloaded. And a simple course about mutual rights and duties. So addressing not just the refugee able to participate to a higher education program, but a more wide population, including also uh, migrants and refugees who, who need the first basic uh, cultural support in order to better try an inclusion path in a new welcoming country. Um, maybe I will provide you more detail in the other question. I will give the floor to Paul now. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Paul O'Keefe. I'm from Enzone at the University of Geneva. Um, we are a humanitarian and academic research center. Um, we, um, or our, I guess our main role is to build education spaces for refugees in developing countries. So we work currently in Jordan, where we have programs in Amman and also in Azraq refugee camp. Um, we also work in Kenya, where I guess our main operation is in Kakuma refugee camp in the north, uh, northwest, and in Dadaab uh, in the north. Um, so we have a portfolio of courses that, that we enable in, in these, these locations, ranging from um, basic medical training, uh, community health, engineering, human rights, these kind of areas. Um, we use a lot of OERs in, in our, for our materials primarily, because in the kind of low resource context that we work, pedagogy or say MOOCs just doesn't work. So we've developed our own kind of learning system to include OERs, um, as materials mainly, um, and then we kind of support that or scaffold that by, by creating this learning ecosystem with um, uh, WhatsApp as kind of our main communication tool between the students in Kenya and Jordan and our tutors based in Geneva, um, and also communication with the lecturers. Now, I guess one of the main challenges we face in terms of materials is contextualization. Um, OERs are generally, or the materials are generally for high resource countries or for um, students from the West. Um, it just doesn't work really. So we spend a lot of time kind of modifying our materials that we use. We had one, uh, one example there a few days ago. Uh, something came up in, in the medical course about sports. And I think one of the recommendations was, you know, go to the tennis courts and play around and come on in a refugee camp. So we, we really had to change, uh, change the materials. And again, the, I guess the English language domination of OERs is a huge problem as well, uh, especially in Azraq or in Jordan where we, where we um, have operations because a lot of the students don't speak uh, English very well. Um, also in Kenya as well, we have a lot of French speakers, so it, it's good for us. I mean, we're kind of a bilingual operation, I would say. Um, but students then coming from 
uh, Jordan or coming from Syria in Jordan, their English level is pretty low. So we have to try to develop our OER or our materials with kind of Arabic support to kind of uh, help them along. So that would be, I guess, the two main challenges for us. Marcus? Marcus? Over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Yes. Yes, very much. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I'm the representative from Chiron, and just to give you the first uh, update of the on the on the Padlet, I think there's a small typo in the Padlet because Chiron was not funded in 2019, but in 2015. So otherwise, we'd be only a month old. Um, yeah, Chiron is a German-based NGO. Um, that started with the initial, initial idea to give refugees access to higher education because in contrast to other population, part of the population worldwide, only 1% of refugees worldwide have access to higher um, education. And it is obviously very clearly linked how um, higher education is, comes together with many aspects of improving your life from, ha from housing, from, from health, et cetera, et cetera. So, we consider to be higher education a very relevant point of um, support we would like to offer to this specific group. Um, but as has been already said, there is no one refugee. Um, and also with this not one refugee comes together with we don't have a specific target group in one uh, specific country only. So we try to serve various groups. We have started with a strong focus on students in Germany. We had several offices in other places. We are currently having offices in Jordan and in Lebanon too, but we also obviously have a number of students, for example, in Kenya, but also in, um, in, in, in Far East and other places all around the world. So we have, our group is very, very heterogeneous. Uh, nevertheless, we started with an offer um, towards the students, which is a completely online-based um, um, university study equivalent offer based on MOOCs, which we collected and curated from various providers um, uh, that we have. And we were able to establish good working relationships with them. And we compiled them and added to that additional learning materials and also offered tutorials, online tutorials. Um, to this, but as it has been said also previously, language is a, is a high barrier, especially as it gets more to, to um, field specific English. Most of our contact of course is English. So this is something we are still struggling a lot with. Um, although we are also offering English courses for students. These are partly offline because we cooperate with local partners, mainly here in Germany and Berlin, but we also have, especially for German and English, both again, also um, some digital some digital offers. Um, the previous, or I would say so far developed model of Kaiwen was to give students access to higher university by building up something that could be easily um, accepted from universities. So we have developed close and tight relationships with universities um, with the idea of having our offer easily accepted at universities. So we had learning agreements with universities that made it easy to recognize the points students get here. But as I said, the student group is very heterogeneous and we realized that there is much more need beyond uh, university, uh, university equivalent online study opportunities. So we're currently right now, and we deployed the first new tracks um, just one week ago, shorter study tracks, more job relevant um, study tracks, and also um, educational offers that would not lead automatically into university recognition, be it in Jordan, Lebanon, or in Germany. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Marcus. I think now it's the moment to move to the second question. Second question, the second question was about uh, how our organization are actually working toward inclusion or enabling equity for, for the target group we are talking about for refugees and uh, in what ways we manage to reach out peripheral students through open education. And also in this case, I mean, I think each of us will provide different approaches at 
in general and to to provide the service for target groups such as refugees you need to address several dimensions um, higher education for refugees will start um, to, to deal with the accreditation model and how you can really enable students to be enrolled in a higher education program from this point of view as a university we adopted some guidelines provided by ENIC NARIC so uh, an international consortium participated also by European Commission and Council of Europe that released uh, guidelines for admitting also students refugee students that were not able to provide actual documentation of their previous careers in our specific case nowadays we have 150 students in our university for refugee program enrolled in a higher education program but just one of them needed the application of these guidelines with this background paper and then interviews and exams to assess the actual capacity of the student to be enrolled in a bachelor engineering course all other students in our experience were able to provide us the needed documentation at least for enrolling um, second question is about how those students will be able to actually participate to attend the courses to um, follow the scheduling of a regular higher education course also in the case of a university such as uni Mettuno, who take in consideration flexibility by design our standard students are non-traditional students Main, mainly they are working students now in the last years we face an increase in the number of more traditional students young students that want to enroll directly to an online university but traditionally Students in an online university are 30 years old, 40 years old, working. So we were, we thought we were ready to face flexibility issues. But then we needed to also adapt to a different cultural approach and to language issues. And that's why we produce and then develop language courses as a support tool, also for candidate students that wanted to be enrolled in a, in a higher education course online. Then it comes to technology, because using the existing literature, most of the refugees arriving in Europe are equipped with a smartphone. And most of European uh, welcoming camps are equipped with uh, Wi-Fi connection. But still, studying on a smartphone, maybe it's not just a more comfortable situation. You can do something on a smartphone, but then you will need a, a desktop or a laptop in order to complete assignments and homework and what we did is just to provide them support when applying students were grouped in specific welcoming camp for example we have a, a project with lombardia region and we are supporting 45 refugee students in milan in the same welcoming camp we managed to have an agreement with password a, a phone career operator that provided them equipment, a broader connection, and also technological tools. And then we realized that we, we should provide a more physical support, not just online education, but we decided uh, going beyond our traditional model to provide them also uh, a meeting once a week with a language teacher in order to empower them also from the Italian language point of view for these refugee hosted in Milan and a mentoring meeting with a professor of Union to not come to them understanding if they were encountering difficulties in studying on using our online learning environments if we needed some didactic support for specific courses etc then we perceived another need some of them uh, and as you probably know um, face also psychological issues most of them uh, as a sort of post-traumatic stress disorder caused by the travel they needed to perform in order to arrive to Europe. And so we started providing them this kind of counseling service, not therapy, but just a psychological support using our psychologists in the psychology function. So starting from just providing to them an online learning environment and scholarships in order to let them be enrolled for free in our university, we realized that, we realized that we needed to provide them a more uh, wide support in order to provide the service that we want them to have. The idea at the beginning is uh, if they came here and they were university students or 
already graduated and we don't recognize their scientific capabilities, we, were, we are going to increase the, the tension, the social tension between them and us. So providing access to higher education is a way of inclusion for sure. But then we, you need, if you want to provide them this service, to provide a full umbrella of services that really enabling them to participate in the university course. Please. Okay, um, in terms of uh, inclusion and equity, I, I guess our approach is kind of the, the two main ways. So far, um, our resources that we produce or materials contextualize everything and you know we're constantly building on what we have. We have a lot of, um, I suppose, feedback mechanisms. Um, we're quite lucky in, in our collaborative learning ecosystem that the students have a kind of a direct connection with the lecturer and also with the tutors and facilitator on the ground. So, Everyone's kind of sharing materials at the same time, sharing ideas. Um, and then we do cooperate with other universities, with corporations with MIT, Purdue, Princeton, for example. And we, we tend to develop materials together, um, including kind of the, the, the student voices. So, you know, if something doesn't work this year, we'll modify it for next year. Um, and hopefully it'll work then. Um, the second approach then is in the, uh, the kind of public goods that we create. So um, we have, say, our tutors in Geneva. Um, we train them face to face. We give them training to work with refugees. Um, but we also have an online uh, training course, which is on our website. So it's a public good. Um, and that, that's available and shared throughout the networks that we have. And basically anybody who wants to, to learn how to, how to work try to learn anyway how to work with refugees in these contexts. I can go on there and take the training course. We also have the same uh, or similar course for, facilitator, for facilitators. So uh, um, previous students who so graduated from last year, we take them on as facilitators for the new cohort of students. Um, they're trained face to face on the ground, but they can also take this online course as well. Uh, and that's freely available as well on the website. So that, that, that's kind of our two main approaches. I, I'm just conscious that Marcus has posted in the chat and he's asking our participants allowed to uh, interrupt and ask questions. So what we, what we had said was that we would, we would talk and then there'd be 15 minutes at the end to ask questions. But if there's a burning question, you know, that you really need to ask, I'm sure that's Can I just say that um, I don't think we'll get through all four questions. I think um, if you speed up a little now, we'll get through the three questions. And then we should stop after question three uh, and take comments. There's already one question in the chat that's aimed at us. Okay. Uh, so, so we leave the questions to the end and we need to speak faster. Okay. So <laughs> I'll just say very quickly in terms of the uh, equity. We had a very interesting, we were in the, the session just before this led by uh, Bayo de los Arte, and uh, we were talking about issues of equity. And one of the things we discussed was um, that access isn't enough that you need to put in support to enable people to access the opportunities that are available. So um, our model is basically to work with local partners who support learners where they are to access the level of learning that they're ready to engage with. Um, and then the idea is that we can provide pathways for them to reach their learning goals, whether that be higher education or uh, work-related skills or whatever. Um, in terms of higher education, the Open, Edu Open University in Scotland, and I must say it's the Open University in Scotland because there's different funding models in each of the nations of the UK. So in Scotland, um, Scottish Government ha has waived um, the residency requirement to access um, grants for, for higher education. So refugees would leave to remain can, um, can access funding for higher education, but at the moment, uh, asylum seekers can't yet. So there's more to be done. Marcus? Thank you very much. I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Um, when you, but when you take a look at um, the initial approach of, un of, of, of Chiron having universities, digital learning, and refugees worldwide, it becomes quite obvious that lots of uh, help and support is needed for bringing these three aspects together. So on the um, side of bring, making students able to participate um, digitally, we had preparatory um, 
parts in the in the in the campus where students would be trained in how to do it online uh, studying online we all know that studying online is more demanding or people are less used to this uh, compared to traditional ways of learning um, when it comes to the content we also add a separate a separate prep section which helps the student getting closer to the content of the actual um, higher education uh, education and we also tried to um, how, how, how to to ease the path towards university with some kind of learning agreements we had with the universities making acceptance a um, bit better but as I said as we're expanding our offer towards more job oriented and smaller study tracks we also realized that this is bringing education in to the students. And what we do here especially is, whereas you have previously groups from big providers who are targeting more professionals who want to enhance their careers, or you have scattered information all over the place, Kyron also wants to make a more refugee focused offer in various areas like like healthcare, agriculture, infrastructural development. So things that could be more, uh, more easily uh, applicable. Okay. Okay. Um, the last kind of area we'll, I guess, we'll talk about uh, in this part anyway, is kind of sustainability and transferability of of, um, of our programs, or, or I guess the learnings that we've taken away from our operations. So I think the main one I, I'd like to talk about is contextualization and relevance of what you do. Um, one thing that works here will not work there, as we all know. So it's all really. I mean, one of the main things that we've worked or that we we've kind of learned, I guess, is contextualizing the material for the specific location that you're in or the specific audience that you're working with. Um, it, it's, it's hard to do. It takes a lot of resources, a lot of time, but it's really worth it because, you know, you, we found that like parachuting something in, say in a MOOC uh, form from the States, just it's not going to work unless you really kind of modify it and adapt it for, for the local audience. Um, I guess sustainability as well really for us has been about building networks with the partners that we work with. So all, all the NGOs that, that kind of facilitate our work on the ground, it's really, really key for us to, to you know, form strong relationships. Um, because say if we're getting, we're in a, a new location or we are um, trying to get a new course off the ground, um, just getting the, the bureaucracy that comes with it, especially working in a refugee camp environment, because you have say, the UN system, it's, it's not, an open door policy. There's a lot of checks and balances that we have to follow. So having strong relationships and, and, and working well with the people that, that you've built relationships really, really helps. Um, I guess as well, uh, creating public goods as well, like we, we have done. I think it's really, that, that's one way to kind of sustain your work uh, and to, to get it out there and, and to, to be open to other people to contribute. Um, and I think it's all feedback, so getting feedback from the students themselves, knowing what works is so key to, to making your courses or your programs sustainable and, and, and relevant for the students themselves. Okay, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to be very brief about uh, how we make our work sustainable. And I think open, uh, open platforms and open licenses really have a role to play in sustainability. Um, we're very lucky the Open University has its own platform, Open Learn Create. And um, so the, the, the resources that we create in partnership um, can sit on Open Learn Create and they're not subject to project funding coming to an end and the hosting being lost. Um, they, they can continue to sit on Open Learn Create and we will continue to revise them and, and update them if necessary. Um, so that, that's a huge asset in terms of sustainability is having that open platform um, that, that will, it's funding for uh, voluntary sector organizations, NGOs who are working with refugees um, is precarious. So um, having that platform that we know we can sustain is, is a huge asset. Uh, could I also say that we also have, and I think it might be the basis of, of uh, of an ability to, to share practice and resources. The, the research that, that Gabby did, you know, having that, uh, that document where people can contribute resources that they're using, 
I'm just wondering if maybe we could form a community practice around that. Mm -hmm. Just throwing it out there. <laughs> well, I think something, yeah, openness is a key point and consequence maybe, or one is the instrument, but the other is networking. So creating networks first among universities aiming to provide support and refugee because all of us are providing services, but maybe we have already something ready we can share with you and you can give something to us and we both can provide a better service to all of the refugees we are able to reach right now. And also at a more general level, since, as I told before, other actors come to mind when you start providing services to refugees, um, public administration, technology enterprise that needs to provide some support, some equipment, also NGOs that are used and able to provide supporting services to migrants and refugees. That's what we started to do some years ago in order to upscale the, the initiative. And last year we presented a, a proposal to European Commission under Horizon 2020 uh, for a digital transformation project about migration because it was one of the issues addressed by the Horizon <coughs> program and we, we were awarded with and now we are coordinating. And the project ambition is to deliver not just education related services but to widen <coughs> the, the horizon of services provided. For example, in Greece, the approach is that to the newcomer, to the refugee newcomer, the first thing they do is to provide a house. So they need some optimization and effectiveness in this kind of service, and then education comes next. In Italy, we have we had a different approach, and now the approach is, uh, let's say, reshaping. But anyway, opening up the doors, not just to other universities, and university actors, but also to other social actors that ranges from public administration to enterprises to NGOs will let us be sustainable and opening up these kind of initiatives. Mm -hmm. Floor to you, Marcus. Thanks a lot. Um... Yeah, sustainability and especially upscalability are, of course, of, of crucial importance. When it comes to sustainability, Chiron, um, as I said, also is trying to improve in cooperations with various partners, be this the MOOC providers, other organizations. So we try to just to develop a, a business model that is as sustainable as possible. Um, um, and also with having its own platform, I think the foundation is laid to, to be it's in itself um, sustainable, but as I, or as we from Chiron are also very much depending on content that is produced outside of our own company, I think the question of sustainability is is a bit more open because as we see that um, big new providers, especially those of higher quality, which uh, producers from universities, um, are going more and more into the direction of monetarization, um, the question of how open this education can be and how applicable it can be, be um, for, for refugees, I think becomes more and more difficult. So um, um, we are also trying and thinking and developing into the direction that InZone already is moving and trying to implement more OERs, producing maybe O materials. But I think the question of the educational content and where it comes from is crucial for the question of sustainability. Can I just briefly add one thing about a community of practice? Um, so uh, along with MUNHCR, we head up a consortium called Connected Learning and Crisis Consortium. And um, on the website, we can put the link on later, there's a playbook. So it's kind of like a guideline of, of, of working in these contexts. So if anyone's interested, kind of over so there's one question that's coming for Marcus on the tablet. Marcus, I've typed it into the chat box in Zoom. Uh, I don't know if you hear it here. Okay. So, shall I read it out? Oh, okay. Fine. Hey, Marcus, we have a question for you. Um, hi, Marcus. Thank you for your contribution. Could you give more details about the MOUs with universities to give credit for the training that you deliver, e.g. the frameworks for the recognition of prior learning? Oh, you're... 
muted, I think, you see? No, no? you're okay. Sh fine. Shall I answer right now or after we have the fourth round of... Uh... Uh, right now, I think, yeah. Right yeah? Now. Okay, good. Um, the MOUs are a first step of cooperation with universities. As I said, we have corporations with approximately 50 something universities right now in Germany and we're trying to establish this also in Lebanon and Jordan, whereas there is a bit more difficult because the regulations on how much of um, study content can be done online are different compared to, to Germany. And um, of course, we are also active in the CLCC network and also as part of the Evaluate uh, project, which is a European uh, community initiated project with the Enigmatic, where that exactly tackles that point. Um, but as in Germany, the situation is a bit difficult because we have um, education is not under the uh, national government's uh, control, but it's, it's a strongly federalized system. So each and every country has their own sovereignty on education. So we do, when we have agreements with universities and agreeing on procedures of, of how RPRs, um, RPL is happening, um, we approach the universities directly instead of having an, an, an umbrella organization that would organize it for the entire country. So what we do is we have MOUs, um, which is just a memorandum of understanding, and we send to the university um, a set of information that is pretty much standardized about learning context, the outcomes, um, the working hours, the examinations, the provider, et cetera, et cetera. Also as much content on the, on the courses that we have compiled as possible. And then university takes this description and matches it with existing um, study tracks, offline study tracks at their universities. So after going back and forth and getting information back and forth from both sides, um, universities and Chiron come to an agreement that certain parts of the curriculum are acceptable as ECTS in their university. So previous, previously students only have so-called Chiron study points, uh, sorry, Chiron credit points which are calculated the same way that ECTS are, but they are, of course, no ECTS because we are no higher education institution. But once university is based on the learning agreement where the matching has been identified, except these uh, prior learnings, these Chiron credit points can be transferred into ECTS. Does that answer the question? I'm not sure who the question came from. Does that answer your question? Very much so. Thanks for the comments. Hmm? Sorry? It's a yes. Ah, it's a yes. Good. And then I say a thanks. <laughs> there are other questions, Gabby? Um, no, maybe I'll just come and okay, stand yeah. here where I can be heard. Um, so, and just because I've been following the Padlet, um, and I am guessing it's James who's sitting Sorry. up the front there. Who's speaking uh, not supposed to be doing. No, it's <laughs> absolutely wonderful. We now have a whole fifth um, institution organization represented on the Padlet describing exactly how they work with refugees in open online higher education, the challenges they face, all the questions that you guys have answered. James asked for Dublin City Great. University as well. So that's a really useful resource. And maybe James wants to come and join the panel and just speak right. a bit. You, you need to stand here so that Marcus can hear yeah, you through the mic. Sure. That's the only reason, if you don't mind. Thanks. <laughs> Never a good deed goes on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose it's on a much smaller scale than what other people are talking about or some of the other issues that people are talking about. But a number, DCU is one of a number of Irish universities that has begun University of Sanctuary scholarship schemes and they, they, they come in different sizes and flavors in the different institutions and the, the, the levels of support, the types of support differ. But uh, uh, Dublin City University has some on-campus scholarships where they support students through their, uh, I think, principally undergraduate um, qualifications. And then in where me and Eamon work in uh, the DCU, DCU Connected, we're in the Open Education Unit. We're supporting, I think, over the, la if the, over the last two years, we now have 12 or 13, I can't remember the exact number, um, online learners. So they are either, they are mostly asylum seekers living in Ireland's deplorable direct provision mm -hmm. centres, which is a, you know, a weird phrase for places that they make 
uh, asylum seekers live, where they get very little money and the conditions are usually not very good. Um, so they are, they are studying from there mainly. We do have a small number who have refugee status and because they couldn't get any funding studying with us anyway because of higher, higher education funding constraints, uh, we can keep them when they re have refugee status. And they, we basically try to provide logistical and financial support to them for them to be able to study. Um, so that's what we're doing in, in a, our small little scholarship. Thank you. Can I add something briefly about prior, uh, recognizing prior learning? Um, it's really it's a major issue for us, um, particularly in, in Kenya, where people have cross borders without taking their certificates and so on with them. Um, what we do in, in Geneva is, if a student has taken three of our courses, we recognize that as a capability. So it's kind of equivalent to having um, you know the, the capacity to get onto a course. So maybe that's something that, that Irish universities could consider as well, um, you know, kind of retroactively uh, recognizing um, people's abilities, I guess. Can I add to that? Um, it's not a project that we've been involved in, but it's uh, one, of our, one of our partners is involved with another university, Glasgow University, in recognizing medical qualifications and fast-tracking refugees to be able to work in the NHS. So that, that might also be a project that people will be interested in looking into. I can't remember the name of the project, but I will add it to the padlet. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And um, I think we might have more questions on the padlet. We can look out for that. And Marcus, if you have any more to add, we can do that as well. I just thought we have about 10 minutes before the end of the session. So it's your opportunity to ask the panel questions. And what we're going to do is repeat the question here so Marcus can hear it, but you don't all have to get up. And um, you are welcome to sit back down if you would be more comfortable. Um, so yeah, let's open it up um, for you here in the room. And Gabby is hopefully going to keep an eye on Padlet for other online questions. Um, and then we'll leave you all to make a quick closing remark or some description as there are so many of you. Do anybody have any questions or thoughts or comments? Um, yes, please. And could you tell us who you are and where you are from? Okay. We had a good question here from a colleague from Birkbeck College in London, and we we're talking about bringing together different um, practical approaches to working with refugees in this area. I'm just, I think um, Paul wants to come in on that question. You'll have an opportunity to contribute as well if you like. Paul, do you want to respond? Yeah, I mean, there, there is the CLCC at the moment. Um, I do know that there are plans afoot to, to maybe establish something um, on a like higher education level, so university level. Um, the INEE as well is very, very active in this area. Um, so I'd suggest having a look at their website and, and there's, there's so much information up there for you. Can you add the links to the Padlet? Yeah, of course. Yes. Thank you, Paul. Um, Marcus, would you like to come in at all? Do you have any immediate, immediate comments? Mm, not directly on international partners. Of course, we are partnering with various uh, institutes, like we are also part of the CLCC uh, and other, other organizations, but also for Germany, for example, there is a national interest in solving, or not in solving the problem, but in, in, in dealing with the uh, situation of having refugees in the country that need access to higher education, but also looking at this from a very, um, from an aspect of having chances added to this. So the opportunity of internationalization of higher education, of having uh, new uh, non-traditional groups giving access to the universities and so on. Um, so I think there's a, a mutual interest from many sides in this, where refugees may, may have been the initial uh, incentive of starting this kind of, of, of thinking, but that could go far beyond this. Thank you, that's really helpful. I think we have a few more questions. I think there were, yeah, please. Spain, and um, I'd like to know your opinion on what we can do within the 
because what worries me if I can explain this in case is that we have holding caps, I'm not using any fancy names, we have holding caps in South Spain, but also the refugees are actually just kept. And what they're told is okay, we want to uh, study your status, tell us who you are, where you're from, blah blah blah, then once you've got proof, you've got refugee status, you'll have access to all the resources you, you need. It sounds wonderful, but the reality is that more than 95% of the people that go to the are turned down and they're kicked out. So therefore, people who arrive, they don't want to know anything about it. And it seems to me that politicians are just not terribly open to the idea of supporting them. So, so what can we do to... Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Marcus, um, the question is about um, what... Um, Gabby's already typed. Oh, I was in a conference a couple of days ago in, in a different continent in the conference the panel session was about scientific diplomacy uh, what scientific diplomacy is and how it works and I think this kind of initiative are exactly what scientific diplomacy is scientific diplomacy is letting different universities from different countries with different political views acting together to find a solution to a global challenge. And mm -hmm. acting in this way is doing scientific diplomacy. And in some way, it will have an impact on political decisions. You cannot go directly to the politicians asking for mm -hmm. funding. Okay, I don't know the situation in Spain, but in Italy, you will not receive them. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, or asking for changing their mind and their approach. But if you are able to let them find the things already solved in some way, if you bring to them a solution, and not a request for a solution, they maybe want to put their label on your solution and say, okay, <laughs> it's what happened. This is what's happening any day for every issue. And I think so being proactive, uh, a different example, we are working with UNED and other universities in Europe for another project, um, a different forward-looking innovation project about short learning programs. Short learning programs are something we want to, to add to the Bologna process. Uh, it's similar to what, we, what you presented about these short programs, more professional oriented, not lasting three years or two years, but still provided by higher education institutes. So an academic program, not lasting three years, but maybe six months, mm -hmm. more enterprise oriented, labor market oriented. We didn't ask the Bologna process group to include this recommendation. We are trying to pilot this, to mutually recognize those courses among the partnership and to make them aware of the fact that we are already doing it. You want to add the Bologna process? Okay, I think this is the way things should work for having an impact on the political level. Mm -hmm. um, Jill, would you like to add anything to that? Thank Just you very much. From a very different perspective, um, the Scottish Government is much more approachable in terms of engaging on, on refugee education and integration. Um, but I think that's relatively easy to do when you have a very small number. And Scotland is not a destination country. Nobody arrives directly in Scotland. Um, it, we're probably the very furthest part of Europe geographically. Um, so I think you're always going to have political considerations because the bigger the issue is for your government, the more they're watching the polls, they're watching what voters think, they're watching what the media thinks, whereas in Scotland we have a very different situation because we actually have a small number that is not very high on the political agenda. So I don't know what the solution is there, I'm just offering a different perspective. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have time for one more question if there is one in the room. Um, and we'll check on the Padlet as well. Otherwise, I thought we would invite the panel, including Lady Garvey this time, to each just um, leave you with maybe thoughts or calls to action and opportunities for contributing further. So, um, if there are, if Marcus goes first, it seems to lead on what remains to be done. So that might be a good way to close the session. That sounds great. Um, Marcus, we'll hand over to you in a minute to um, speak that, but I'll also invite Garvey over now so she can maybe follow on from you and then everybody else here on the panel can help giving just closing comments. So over to you, Marcus, and then to Gabi. 
Sorry, I didn't properly understand what is requested from you right now. Just so we're, we're doing closing remarks. We thought this would be a good time to talk about what remains to be done. Ah. Okay. okay. Good. Yeah. So, um, poof. What remains to be done? There's so, so, <laughs> so much remains <laughs> to be to be done. Um. <clears throat> Um, what remains for us to be done is, uh, I already tackled a bit on the question of sustainability, but what I didn't uh, talk too much about is the question of scalability, because if we just take a look a number of, 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 of a, look, a, sheer, a look at the sheer numbers of refugees worldwide and how much OERs and open education could improve their situation, um, um, I think the question of, of scalability may be even more crucial um, than sustainability. Um, and for us, from what I see right now, and I, I'm not sure if this how much applies this to the others too, is the, 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 I wouldn't say the gap, but a little bit kind of a tension between the numbers of refugees we see that are coming, having studied OERs or not, coming to universities, applying there, becoming parts, becoming a part of an academic world, or not doing so, because I think the, uh, the, 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 the use um, of OERs and digital learning um, um, is, and the need for this is also much more on the side of non-academic academic learning. And what remains to be done here is, at least from our side, to understand much more the complexity of situations. Which skills, which competences do need, do people need in which places? How can they tra be transported there? I mean. The gap between having WhatsApp groups like Inzom very successfully uh, does in uh, in the Kenyan camp compared to a fully um, supported MOOC, it's a huge it's a huge technical gap. So, what do we need to bring to whom? How? I think this question is still so incredibly difficult to answer. Would you like to add? You have had the opportunity okay. to speak, and we're nearly out right. of time. Okay, I'll be really, um, really short. I think um, I've learned a lot through this collaboration with the panel, um, and I've learned two kind of overarching things out of the process of preparing for this conference. One is there is a lot of very good work going on, but it's happening in pockets, and you have to dig out that information. So I, just because it's part of the research I'm doing, um, I was kind of Googling that time, and through a mutual acquaintance, someone who knows someone who knows, knew Alessandro, I met him, and it's like, and Joe and I met through something completely, well, through OER, um, and, you know, I only knew about Barbara's work and your work from a Google Scholar. So I think the one thing is, this is, and, and then I discovered what DCU, Dublin City University, was doing um, very recently as well. So we're beginning to network, and I think we need to do more of that. And the other thing is I've met up with people who call themselves practitioners and want to not be called academics because they're not academics, but they are working very closely on the ground in charities and local organizations and organizations with refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants. And they want to work with academics because they recognize we have access, we know how to write bids for funding and stuff like that, or we should know how to. <laughs> we, we know where to find funding sources and we're often looking for projects. So there's a desire to collaborate and I'm not sure that we've figured that out very really well yet how to do that. So I think those are the challenges it's about networking, collaborating, sharing and building on each other's good practice. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a beautiful note on which to draw the formal part of the session to a close. I'm sure our panelists will be around to answer any more questions. But if you just put your hands together and take very much. Thank you. 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 Thank